In Conversation with Terry Shepard, award-winning broadcaster, narrator, and author. A deep dive into the writer's craft with the artists and support systems who create the stories we love. Patricia Laughlin is the author of the Sacrifices of Kingdoms series. Book one, Sacrifices for Kingdoms, was launched in October 23, and book two, Sacrifices Beyond Kingdoms, premieres on June 18th of this year. As an artist, she created a medium called Unique Staining on Wood, which earned her the prize of excellence in a competition involving 52 countries held at Tonin's Museum in France. Currently, she is focused on researching and writing, which has taken precedence over her painting. Born on the multinational Caribbean island of Trinidad, she attended high school in England before moving to the United States with her husband and their three children in 1979. Her early start in world travel provided her with invaluable education. Above all, she identifies first as a wife, a mother, and a grandmother. Patricia, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Give us a sense for the Sacrifices series. What will readers discover in these books? A lot of interesting psychology is added to the love story. And people are well-traveled in this book, educated. My female protagonist, Elizabeth, is no Cinderella. She comes from a fairly wealthy family. She's an only child, and it's been ingrained in her to be honest, but not to put on airs and act as if she's better than others, that she's not to also let people put her down, and because sure as heck, she is as good as anyone. As a result, she is highly educated, very intelligent, is accepted at NYU in New York at age 16, where her very wealthy aunt and uncle live. And her mother's sister married a billionaire, one of the few left today. And they to, to go over as their daughter, so to speak, although her parents traveled very quickly whenever there was an issue and often up to New York. And they would often travel with her aunt and uncle all over the world. They did business all over the world as well as did a lot of touristy things. They went to every ruin possible. And as a result, Elizabeth got quite an education in religion and ancient ruins and the shocking situation that all these religions that are patriarchal today and running the planet, before that, there were a lot of goddess-worshipping religions and goddesses together with gods. And this was quite an awakening for Elizabeth. And she started relating it to the damage patriarchal religions are doing through their oppression of females. And that led to her, in her adult years, giving a speech called, God Has No Gender. That is a risky conversation to have nowadays. You're talking about issues like climate change, patriarchy, spirituality, in very modern terms. There's some terms. danger in writing and, stories about that in today's world. Did that concern you at all? Oh, yes. It's risky. But it's factual. So it's about waking people up to the facts and not just, just joining cults without questioning where their origins came from. And so she exposes a lot of these thinking ancient people. And it turns out that, for instance, there are more goddess statues found many thousands of years before any god statue showed up. She goes into a lot of history, and the reality is that we have been ruled by patriarchy for the last two millennia, which has oppressed females. And if you oppress one gender, you oppress all of humanity, because both genders have so much to offer. Their brains may be different, but they have a complementary difference to each other. 
And the fact that the planet has been run by purely the hormone of testosterone for the last two millennia, which is, is a more aggressive, more tunnel vision type, goal-oriented hormone. And the female, the way her brain is better joined, she tends to see the big picture. She doesn't go for tunnel vision. And this is the only way if we can get both brains running the planet equally will lead to lack of conflicts, lack of wars, and eventually our chance at world peace. One of the other things that fascinated me about your series, Patricia, is that these are contemporary romances that are very detailed and passionate. How do you balance those elements of romance with the broader themes in your books? It's life. It's life. You need to have great sex, otherwise it's not worth it. <laughs> and you have to have fun, otherwise what's the point? And even though I write about these serious things in climate change, my, my, one of my male protagonists is a European prince. And he actually addresses the United Nations and goes around the world talking about his title is Climate Change, Man's Fate or Folly. And it's a lot of serious stuff, but we still have to have life, which has fun in it. And it's not just about making money and enjoying all the great things, which they do, but it's about producing, doing something worthwhile for humanity. Otherwise, it's just you waste your life. And Elizabeth particularly, and so was he, and so was my third protagonist, the mystery guy. Um, they were raised to be a producer, not a parasite. And it's not just ambition. They are determined to do something, to make a difference in the world. And they both are about world peace. Patricia Darcy Laughlin is our guest. We're talking about her series, The Sacrifices of Kingdoms. Book one was launched in October of 2023, and book two is just coming out in June of 2024. That's pretty quick. Creation. How do you write so fast? I didn't actually. I'd written the second book a long time ago. Pretty soon after the first one, I started completing it. I've always written from a child. I was always making notes in books. And actually at age 15 in England at school, I wrote an entire Shakespearean play in Shakespearean language. And I've always loved words. I was always learning words. When I was born in a class that didn't interest me, I would sneak out into the ladies' room and with an encyclopedia and learn more words. I just always had to write about the human condition and what we can do to improve it and to have equality in order to save our planet. Because if we continue to have aggression and now we've got all these amazing weapons that could obliterate us in a wink of an eye, we need to have both male and female in power to save the planet and us. What? motivated you to address topics like gender equality and climate change? Because I see it all around me. And now in, in our country, in the United States, what's going on with women's rights is a disgrace. What is it that people feel they have to control a woman and how she thinks and what she can handle in her life? They don't do that to the men. And why is it that we think that men are more entitled to run the show? They're not doing that great a job. We can't get peace yet anywhere. All over the planet, we're still having conflicts. Nobody's discussing these things properly. Like the art of negotiation is lost because the guys just want to go bullheaded and opinionated and pompous and their way is the only way. It's just wrong. And it, it will lead to our destruction. Your dialogue is some of the best that I've ever read. How do you approach writing conversation for your characters on such complex issues? I'm a, a good listener. I've always been not a talker, but a listener. 
and and people know that they, they just get it that I'm genuinely interested in what they have to say and and they know that they can trust me that I won't use their names if I write about their experiences I'm pretty well up on a lot of experiences <laughs> and secrets and I do use them in my books my a lot of people say, well, is this about your life? Of course it's about my life. There's a lot of my own life in there. But there is a lot of the lives of people who have touched my life. And this way I get people to talk to me. They tell me the most private things, even though I hardly know them. They just have trust in me. And that is sacrosanct. We all end up writing that autobiographical portion of the book. Was that a therapeutic or painful experience for you? Both, I'm afraid, both. Yeah, there was a lot of pain, actually. I had to die off a few people, and it was very painful. My husband would walk in the room and I'd have tears all over my keyboard. And he would say, you got to stop, you got to stop. <laughs> and I said, no, I can't stop, I could barely see but I have to continue because my emotion is here. So, yeah, I'm a bit of a softy, but <laughs> uh, I'm also very strong in what I believe. I know it's still early for an October 2023 book as far as feedback goes, but what has been the reaction to book one, Sacrifices for Kingdoms? Um. It's been fantastic in many ways. People who know me and know how I grew up are quite shocked <laughs> that I wrote this book. And they're not just talking about the great sex because I did not write mediocre sex. It's too boring. It's people want details. They want to, to relish and enjoy. And so friends who grew up with me, they would say things like, because of what I wrote about religion, because I was raised with a lot of religion, patriarchal Christian religion. And, but I was lucky to grow up in Trinidad with mosques and temples and people of all religions. So I was always open. And traveling made me realize that it's guys making up all these religions. <laughs> Not a whole lot of women get involved. They're too busy living and trying to straighten everybody out. But basically, I, I just had to continue the trend of the sex mixed with the religion, with fun, and, and international travel. This is the biggest education of all, and I was lucky to have a lot of it. Patricia Darcy Laughlin is our guest. Her website is patriciadarcylaughlin.com. Easy to remember, she is the author of the Sacrifices and Kingdoms series. Book one, Sacrifices for Kingdoms, is available now. Book two, Sacrifices Beyond Kingdoms, premieres on June 18th. What makes a great love scene? Authenticity and details. It should not be just through the sweetness, which is important, the sweetness, of course, and the romance of it, and the, but you've got to have the passion. And, and you don't want to just write about he kissed, they entered, they saw stars, blah, blah, blah. Everyone does that. I wanted an adult situation. And strangely enough, the young people, the 20-year-old group who have read my book, they're so thrilled. They said, oh my God, what an education. We're so glad we read this book. <laughs> Some of the older people are quite amazed. <laughs> How did you learn to write like that? I don't know. I just read a lot. I traveled a lot. And I was always fascinated about writing and getting a story across, trying to enlighten people as well as entertain them. How do you think a multinational life that you have lived has influenced your worldview and your writing? Very much, very much. And we're still traveling. I still have a few places to go to, but we've done the major continents and major countries. And what's fascinating is that everywhere you go and you talk to people, and I talk to everyone, I would talk to any stranger who is friendly. 
And everyone wants the same thing. They want love in their lives. They want romance, but they want fulfillment. And, and they want happiness for their children if they have them. And, and they want a good partner in their life. They want a partner. They don't want a, a boss. So they want strong people, but they don't want a buddy. And everyone really wants the same things, happiness. You said in the introduction, which you kindly sent to me, that your most cherished roles are that of wife, mother, and grandmother. How would those constituents describe you? They were very supportive, including my son's in law. <laughs> and they were quite shocked in some ways, not my children, but the in laws. And now, of course, I have five grown grandchildren. And I have two great grandchildren because we started so young. <laughs> but they've been very supportive. They tell everybody about my books, and they encourage people to read my books. And now that I have children and grandchildren in college, they're spreading the word. I'm getting all these requests for friends from a lot of strange people. <laughs> but it, it's fun, and I just know how to delete the ones that are a little bit wacko, but there are a lot of those too. How do you think social media has changed our world? Tremendously tremendously. Some of it not for the very good, but I think progress is important. And sometimes we have to have some shocks to get progressive and be helpful to this planet and to keep us going. For those who have read book one, Sacrifices for Kingdoms, what can they expect in book two, Sacrifices Beyond Kingdoms? It's a continuation of the love story. So they will continue to get wonderful, romantic, loving scenes, bordering on the erotic, I hope. <laughs> it's important. We've got to enjoy it. But they're also going to get some history lessons, more lessons, newer stuff in my research about the religions and why we ended up with all this patriarchy. And it also encourages people to travel to learn the truth about these things instead of just staying put and just reading. Books are the, a great education, but you sometimes just need to go out there and see what people are writing about to get convinced. We are in conversation with Patricia Darcy Laughlin. Her website is patriciadarcylaughlin.com. How will you define success as an author? If it makes a change in people's minds about why patriarchy was invented, basically, and, uh, and know the, uh, the truth about the ancient goddess and gods together with goddesses' religions that patriarchal, barbaric tribes wanted to covet. These people were developing agriculture, writing, developing medicines from snake venom. Hence, the Bible used the, the snake and made Eve the bad guy. All of this you can relate when you start traveling and you learn about the ancient goddess religions and gods together with goddesses and all the wonderful things they were developing and the type of barbaric tribes that coveted them and actually started to realize the only way they're going to get these people to be under their control is to make up one god. Only one God, and it has to be a male. These people had the muscle, they were bigger, they were not necessarily smarter, but they were very well oriented, very expansive, and they eventually had to kill off a whole lot of worshippers of other religions. It's right in the Bible, actually. You read the Bible, and if you don't understand it, then travel. Go to these places. Words like climate change and patriarchy 
send tendrils of icy fear through entrenched interests and through many males. How do you get guys to be comfortable with change in that world? I think it's happening more and more. Unfortunately, we do have some very strong dictator-type politicians who just run on greed and power over people. But more and more, normal men who are better educated and realistic, and usually men who have families, uh, realize this is not what they want for their families to inherit. And they see the dangers of the dictators who bully other nations, and uh, the weaponry that exists is enough to blow us all up. And if men are allowed to continue with this bullying attitude and having to control everyone, it, it will happen. We, we lose it all. And so we've got to work on the pollution. There's so much we can do. And more and more ordinary people are fighting for this. So that's my hope, to enlighten people and to inspire them and encourage them to do everything they can to get peace on Earth and save our planet. I'm fascinated by your self-created art form that you call Unique Staining on Wood. Actually, I didn't call it, Terry. The press named it. I didn't know what to call it. But I just made it up. And it's on wood, and I have to make my own stains because I stay within the colors of woods. I don't use pink and blue and uh, stuff like that. I use reds and oranges and, of course, browns, lots of browns. So I have to make my own stains. And it was difficult learning how to stop the stain. When you stain wood, it just spreads like a sponge. And I had to learn how to stop that so that people could see the pattern through the grain of the wood. And if they go on my website, they'll see what I mean. I can now control it, and I don't talk about it. It's a secret method. I tried to get my kids interested in doing it, and they said, no way. Mom, you don't sleep. You work so hard. Your hands have calluses. We don't want to do that to make a living. But it was I knew that it was just a stepping stone. It's not just a way to make a living, but I've done very well with it financially sold most of my pieces, but I'm holding on to some for my kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. Interview hosts like me ask a lot of the same questions. Is there a question that you haven't been asked that you wish someone would ask you? I know that people have a lot of remarks about the great romance and the great sex, and why did I end up with the one of the male protagonists being a European prince. No country called in Europe has like almost, what, 12 monarchies? And people forget that. So I didn't want to say where he was from. He's just a European prince. And, and people would guess and have fun with the mystery of it all. But I wanted to also point out that no matter how high a standard we hold monarchy to, they're just people. When you meet them, they suffer the same sufferings and they enjoy the same things and they create the same uh, fun in their lives, in their families' lives, like the rest of us. They're really not different. We are each our own kingdom. And that's the theme of my book. Everyone is their own kingdom for which they make sacrifices. Patricia Laughlin is the author of the Sacrifices of Kingdoms series. Book one, Sacrifices for Kingdoms, is available now. Book two, Sacrifices Beyond Kingdoms, premieres June 18th. Thanks for the conversation. This was great. Thank you so much. It was great for me, too. In Conversation with Terry Shepard is a copyrighted presentation. All rights reserved. I'm Lisa Davis. Join Terry Shepard next time in conversation.